Willie Ferrier is on the line. I hope you're you're on the road somewhere, aren't you? Yes, we are. We've just pulled over because we've got a spot of reception. Oh, thank you so much for interrupting your uh, no road, road trip. <laughs> it was looking a bit sketchy there, so I thought we'd better pull, uh, pull over to avoid any uh, complications. Thank you so much, yeah, because it is live. I, appreci- <laughs> I appreciate it, Willie. Hey, such a I love the song, and that came out this year, but who is Gina in it? Uh, Gina, uh, the song's actually, Gina's, it's not, um, the, first, the person in the song isn't called Gina. Um, it's sort of, I guess, to give the brief summary of the song, uh, two friends of ours, um, and one being the artist who, Harris Keenan, who painted the album artwork and mm-hmm. lives, uh, his friend, his friend and flatmate, Flynn, uh, <laughs> essentially they lived together and they were best friends and they had a, some, what well, they had, what is obviously an incompatible sexual orientation, <laughs> uh, but they were great, great friends, um, and something somehow sort of just sparked off. Uh, as as things can sometimes happen, there was a connection. They were just such good mates, and they got on so well. Uh-huh. Uh, and being there right up, like sort of knowing them at the time, and sort of seeing it all unfolding as a songwriter was just such an interesting experience. And I learned so much from the situation because they managed to, even though when when sometimes when things get complicated and physical, uh, it can often ruin relationships, good friends, and all sorts of things. So um, I just really respected the way that they handled it. He and I, I think the thing I respected the most was uh, sort of, uh, and I guess where the song comes from is just the sensitivity that he had around it, just how they both handled it and mm. how they both managed to put their friendship first and they're sort of, they're still great friends now and I think they're still, yeah, they're still living together. It's just like, it was something that was really beautiful and I admired and as a songwriter, when that sort of thing happens around you, you feel compelled to write about it. So the basis of the song is essentially uh, uh, respecting and caring about someone uh, and wishing you could be what they wanted as opposed to wishing you could change them to want you. Okay. Oh, it's got quite quite a lot of meaning then, hasn't it? Yes, it does. Mm, but to me it, and to the, to the people to the it's people. about. I That's right. I think they very much love the song too. It's a, it's a great song. It really is. It's a great song for today. I mean, what a beautiful uh, afternoon it is. Must be fun heading off t- to your next gig, which is Cheviot, you said. Yeah, no, no, that's just where we're staying tonight. We're, we're, we've just uh, driven down and we're doing our, just finished our Southern leg of the tour. So we did Christchurch, then Wanaka, uh, sorry, Dunedin, Wanaka, Queenstown Thursday, Friday, Saturday mm-hmm. and then Josh and I, the guitarist, just loved everything back in the van, the boys have got off easy enough, slide back up to Auckland and then we're just driving the, the, the van back haul. up uh, back, back all the way up, doing the long haul, trying a few pies on the way. <laughs> yeah, right Okay, so you've already conquered <laughs> Christchurch and Dunedin, how were those gigs? Oh, they were amazing, I think it's, we sort of forgot how great it was to play shows because we played um, with our producer, CJ, and his band, Marco Road. We played probably, I think it was like August last year, was it? August last year uh, at the car station with them, and that was sort of like our last gig. We said we were going to take a little bit of a break, mm. and then, boom, it goes. we go into lockdown for months, uh, and we sort of all separate, and finally we get back to Auckland. Everything's looking dicey. We just make the call uh, to essentially not book any gigs for fear that we would just uh, book gigs and then get ready for them, and then they'd be cancelled. Uh, so we just kind of made the hard call to go uh, with our, it wasn't too hard to be honest, it was a great time, but yeah. uh, with our producer and the whole band, we up, um, we loaded up four cars and um, his van and went up to uh, Mangafai, which is sort of like the spiritual home of our music, oh. uh, and went up to the beach house there and just locked it up, moved everything out of the living room and set it up as a, the whole house as a recording studio. Uh, for about, about a month and a half, almost almost two months. Cool. And um, and just got he did all see, uh, Connor Jane, our producer, did all sorts of crazy stuff, setting up mics and stairwells and catching reverb from the back of the house and oh, all sorts of wild stuff. So we had a lot of fun. We learned a lot. We all got COVID together and and based in our infectiousness <laughs> together. I think half the vocals on the album have a sprinkling of Corona <laughs> yeah. uh, in them, which is just that little bit extra grit. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it was it was it was a lovely process, and we're so stoked to be out on the road now. So going down to uh, play those shows, um, I mean, even just Christchurch, like the first tour of the show, the tour, it was so great going on stage and having probably one of the best crowds we've ever, we've ever had, and singing back our songs off the new album to us, obviously, and some, singing some old ones with us. So mm. that was 
it was really special, and we're glad we've we've we we're, we're, we're stoked with the show we've managed to be able to put together. And we can't wait for the second half of the tour. It's going to be so much fun. Oh, it's just fantastic! And you know, I mean, you're not you're no strangers to live gigs. You've done so many live shows, and I guess that's. I mean, you've only been going since 2019, and when you think of what you've achieved. It's uh, it's pretty epic, and now of course your debut album, uh, which is uh, Bienvenido, uh, and is anyone in the first time? Anyone in the band (laughs) Spanish? Thank you. No, they're not. But in the song, uh, I I guess so. As a brief. summary of the song essentially some friends and I before I was a musician this is probably like five or six years ago now yeah. at least uh, on my way over to uh, to do my OE and, uh-huh. and live in London with the Rugby World Cup it was 2015 so seven years ago now nice. Christ. Yep. <laughs> and uh, we on our way over me and a group of friends uh, decided to have a month in uh, the south of Spain so we headed south to Sevilla and had a great time drove around being a bit uh, just doing what Kiwis do abroad, just getting drunk too early in the day and just having fun, yeah, right. making fools of themselves with the local girls. <laughs> and we get to uh, Alicante, a seaside town, and all, shit all breaks loose. <laughs> um, we, at, at the end of the night, sort of quite late, my friends were outside sort of crying about their dead cats, and I couldn't quite get on the level. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I have this Italian fella come up to me and say, would you like to find the club with the girls? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, absolutely, that's what we're looking for, mate. Uh, we're looking for a, a nightclub with, with some girls. <laughs> yeah. And so he said, okay, well, I'll bring you. And I said, no, we need to we need to take my friends too. And, and he said, he looked one look at my friends on the ground and said, uh, maybe not. If you like uh, if you like the club, you can bring your friends back. I said, okay. <laughs> so anyway, this, this guy uh, leads me on an absolute goose chase down to some uh, random building. And we climb, must have been like 20 plus flights of stairs. Um, which is referred to in the song, and all of a sudden we get to a door, he knocks on it, uh, and this lady in a, a, what turned out to be the maitre d' uh, opens up in a big pink fluffy dressing gown, and all I can see behind her looks like Paris Hilton's bedroom, everything is just pink and fluffy. Whoa, okay. And uh, she says, Bienvenido, and I walk in, and she snaps her fingers, and, and all these all these girls uh, in their underwear start walking in in sort of like a catwalk <laughs> formation, uh-huh. um, all saying, hola, hola, with that. Uh, just some underwear on and yeah, I yeah. was sort of my jaw hit the floor and I realised that this wasn't a nightclub it was a different sort of club <laughs> uh, it's not the sort of club that you dance on your feet and that's the, that's the chorus of the song right that's, um, that's and so, so we, cool. I, I got out of there I was like geez this is, uh, this is highly illegal I'm pretty sure and I've got my passport and my friends don't know where we are so I panicked and just said, look, i got to go. This is not what I expected. Mm. And I uh, ran back to the nightclub to find my friends uh, in a full-scale brawl with about 14 Spaniards. Oh, wow. Uh, and so everything boils over into a, a big sort of tussle, a um, bit of yelling match, a few, a few arms thrown and legs thrown. And then uh, out uh, around the corner storms, sort of like 10 to 15 military police all decked out in black gear with some machine guns and For real? Uh, they all scattered all the Spaniards and we got arrested uh, got our passport seized and it was the first time I've ever had any gun pulled on me let alone 10 at once that's um, insane and everyone's screaming in Spanish and we don't speak Spanish and <laughs> there's a bit of resisting going on from some of my uh, friends um, and I think one of them got their head smashed against the concrete wall for resisting. Ooh. And then eventually it just boiled down into me starting to sober up and realise how bad the situation could be and it might mean we don't even get granted our visas and we don't even make it to the to, to London. So totally. I just turned around, found the commandant who, who was who spoke English. Uh, they're, they're called the Juárez Civil, so it's like the military police. And I'd heard you don't get caught by them. So I was desperate. And I just begged. I begged and begged for about five minutes. Used all my Spanish and all my English as well. And just absolutely begged the guy and said, look, if you give us our passports back, we'll never come back to Alicante again. He says, look, if you're gone by, uh, I said by 8 a.m. we'll be gone. He says, 6 a.m. and never come back to Alicante. <laughs> and you're like, and I don't I said, care. Okay, that sounds like a good deal. A- any any time, I'm gone. Even if you said like by 1 yeah. a.m., you would have been like... What? Exactly, exactly. So that's Bienvenido, and it's whilst it doesn't direct that story doesn't directly relate to the concept of the whole album. Bienvenido in Spanish means welcome, and we thought that was a very uh, <laughs> fitting title track for a band who's sort of started in COVID, then had to lock down and pretty much went off the radar. 
Uh, they've just decided to, instead of looking outwards to the world, we just decided to turn inwards for a period of six months, seven months, and just hone an album together, find our sound, and just really work on the songwriting, and we're stoked with what we came out with. Oh, look, you should I'm be... I'd like to welcome people to listen to it, hence the name. Exactly. You should be really proud, because I've got a couple more songs lined up, and they're, they're really good. I mean, what what a great uh, first album. But you bad boys, what a story. Alicante, everything went crazy. Whew. Yeah, that was a bit wild. Oh, I reckon. <laughs> Actually, Even like- when I woke up the next morning, I wasn't a songwriter yet, but I knew... I uh, thought to myself that would make a good song. Yeah, 100%. But you haven't actually... <laughs> so that's more the album... Uh, I mean, uh, so uh, the the title track, does it does it reference that a wee bit? Yes. That uh, night? Yes, it does. So yes. the, 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 the first... The title track, Be In The Nino, is all about that night. So it essentially... Yes. Um, at the chorus is be in the Nino, baby, take a seat beside the sort of club where you can dance on your feet. Right. Um, that was my classic miscommunication. When he said club, I thought dancing, uh, but I should have paid more attention to the word girls. I think that was uh, in his, in his uh, mix of Italian, Spanish and English. There was obviously a, a miscommunication. He could have just said he was a pimp and I would have got the point. Yeah. Um, but maybe he used the Italian word for that and that's why it was lost in translation. But had that not not happened, you know, it wouldn't have given you this great album and this this title. Oh, track. absolutely, no re- no regrets, no, no regrets at no. all. And and the story, what, what I don't a even story. need to go back to Alicante, you know. I've already had I've had my fill of Alicante. <laughs> I think you lost something there that night, and so, yeah. so oh, that, that's well, not your virginity anyway, by the sounds anyway. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I was a good boy. I, I I turned right around. I panicked, to be honest. I just thought I'm an illegal. Uh, brothel in the middle of Spain and my friends had absolutely no idea where I was. I've got my passport, all my stuff, so um, oh, I, I turned around. Bonkers. <laughs> that's, that's, that's crazy. Can't wait till you go uh, touring again in Europe and what, you know, like, um, once you... I suppose, that is, that is that the plan? You know, like, I mean, you've got this Kiwi tour, but uh, do, do you think that, you know, it's um, that's calling you as well? I think, I think so. I mean, it is definitely calling us. Um, we'd love to make it work somehow, especially potentially uh, at the end of next year, um, as there's going to be a hell of a lot of Kiwis and Australians and who are probably our two biggest audiences, especially Australia, mm. uh, all over for the Rugby World Cup in in Paris. And I think a few of the band are going to be there as well. So okay. if we could try it, if we were going to do it next year, it would be around that time and we'd love to make it work. But we've got to tick off Australia first because it's by far our biggest listenership. Isn't that interesting? So, yeah, and so what's the plan there? Have you got anything booked for next year in Oz? Uh, nothing booked yet, but we're just trying to uh, go through the, the you know the paces of that. Now we've sort of got to tick off our first tour before we worry about our second. But it's pretty it's pretty exciting, and we want to keep the momentum up, and we we just want to go play more shows. And it just feels a bit weird that there's you know however many Australians listening to our our music, and they've not one of them has ever seen us play yeah. live. Yeah, and we're right. always getting messages and stuff, and you feel a little bit helpless when people want to want to buy your. Um, buy your music and, and come to your shows and buy your merch and stuff, but there's uh, not a real, no real ability to um, to do it for them, you know? So yeah. we will get over there. We will play some shows, um, and we're excited to do so, hopefully uh, early next year. That's right. So if anyone's missed you guys, and I'm really disappointed with myself, but I had a house full of people, but I could have seen you at Yonder on Saturday night and seen the Seaside Stranglers, so I really... I really messed up, but um, for those yeah, of you... shout out to those boys. They did, a, they did a great job. It was amazing. They played twice with us. The, the and then from what I hear, great, we... Aren't they? <laughs> they are. They are. They are. And I, from what I hear, when we went back to their house afterwards, uh, we stayed up until about... 4.35 a.m. jamming, and I think it got Sam, the drummer, into a bit of hot water. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I was across the paddock, and I could hear yeah, it. I and I was like, and if I'd known it was you guys there, I would have actually chucked my clothes on and just come over and listen. They come across, and we could have done the interview at 4.30 a.m. For God's sake. It, well, I just, <laughs> so many missed opportunities. I'm so annoyed about the weekend that, that I could have had so much more fun. But, you know, it was hilarious, because I was thinking... That sounds like that sounds like a bass. That doesn't sound like an actual, you know, a record. Yeah. It doesn't sound like anything on iTunes. No, yet. we got we really got the bass, Sam. We we turned up into <laughs> such a lovely place there as well. We turned up. Um, we went we went past all the houses, got all the alcohol, drove the tour van there, and then parked up and got the bass amp and out and everything. We had sort of two bands going at it for four hours or whatever it was. Yeah. So I just got the feeling. I just saw like Woolshed Field. 
Uh, I thought we didn't have any neighbours where we were. So. I know. Uh, only- it wasn't until about four in the morning that Sam's uh, four thirty or whatever it was that Sam was like, "Look, we might have to wind things down." I'm like, "Hey, mate, <laughs> you should have told us. We'll, we'll get the fuck out of here." <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because there's but, a, but we but we needed that, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, there was. I, look, you do, and I mean, you know, you're on a. I, I totally get it. I thought I thought it was pretty cool, actually. And in the future, I can say, did you guys know that the band No Cigar actually jammed in this very room? We can put up a plaque <laughs> and say, you know, when you. I when think you, we wrote a few songs as well. So the next album might you? have some songs written uh, in that wall shed. Well, I'm super proud to hear that. I think I think that's amazing because the wall shed is a very creative little space. It's one of my favourite um, places. It's just got something, hasn't it? It's got something special. It does. Yeah. It was an absolute vibe. But thank you for having us. Awesome. No, listen, <laughs> listen. Honestly, it was funny. I just, as I say, I'm just wanted to see you. So my question was, like, there's a couple more gigs on this tour, aren't there? Is, are you going to the Hawks Bay? We are. I think so. What was that? We've ticked off Queenstown now. Then we've got our. Uh, Napier yeah. uh, at the Paisley stage on the 21st of October. That's our next show, so we'll be going back, um, sharpening up, probably just mixing the set up a little bit, trying some other songs on the album that we haven't got to play live yet, um, and just keep it interesting. It's nice to have the luxury of whatever we've got, 20 songs or something out now, maybe just under, as opposed to having an EP and a couple of singles out, we can do a little bit more uh, set craft and sort of put a show uh, catered to and tailored to the audience and stuff, which is... I guess one of the more exciting parts about playing live music is reading the room and doing things uniquely. So yeah, right. We've got that uh, pacing stage. I think we've got uh, sort of a little bit of, of a hiatus mid mid uh, mid tour, and then we're just going straight back into three days on the trot. Uh, Napier at the Paisley stage. Then we're playing uh, the Longline Classic Festival in oh, Disney, yeah. and then we're, we're headlining the uh, Gisborne uh, First Light Fest, the Wine and Food Festival, on the twenty oh, nice. third. Oh, great. Um, so, and then we've just got the, the mount on the 29th of October and then heading back home to the uh, to the to the home city, Auckland, uh, for Galatos on the November the 5th, which we're st- bloody excited for. Oh, I reckon that, that will be a fantastic gig. That is definitely one that I could uh, I could see myself getting to, actually. It's a Guy Fox night, too, coincidentally. Ah, uh, it is. Remember, remember the fifth ah, of November. Rem- yeah, that's right. So, um, hey, the band's super lucky there to have go. someone as I. That might give us some ideas for on stage, uh, <laughs> yeah. on stage theatrics. Yeah, why don't you do a <laughs> pyrotechnic show like a bit like Kiss or something? You know, make it a metal like Ramstein. Like, yeah, Ramstein. There you go. <laughs> Woo! I'm sure they'd love that to Galatos if you just um, blew well, up. We the could place. maybe we could cover Do Heart. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Look, the, the sky's the limit. But I'm just saying, you're, you're a very articulate uh, man, Willie, and I, th- I think it's a, a wonderful thing because I guess being a songwriter, that, that the words come naturally to you, do they? Uh, yeah, I'd say so. I definitely, that, that's where I came uh, to songwriting from. It was essentially, I, w- I, love, I love words, I love telling stories. And I love expanding my vocabulary. I like to use lyrics uh, that invoke emotion, and I find it's best to do that by using lyrics that you don't hear all the time. You know, like yeah. you could use uh, the most powerful words in the human language, but if you hear them all the time in songs, then they lose their effect. There's a dilution. Yeah. Um, so so if, you, if you if you try to arrange words and I guess just use words that aren't always um, chosen. Mm. Uh, you'll you'll end up finding more interesting lyrics, I think. And I think the only other thing that comes with lyricism, I guess, is that it's important, and I always tell other songwriters in terms of my process, it's important to have 150% emotion when you're writing the lyrics and use the words that even if you boil up when you're writing the song, you boil the emotion that you're writing about up to until it's overflowing almost to a psychotic level. (laughs) And then you start writing lyrics and some of that intensity of feeling will hopefully translate because a lot of it gets lost. So it's your job to yeah. choose the words that evoke the most emotion from you and hope that some of that is translated. Exactly. And that's a fantastic songwriting tip because uh, unless you're being true to yourself and and pretty much leaving everything in the song, which sounds like what you do, it's like you give it all and then you chuck in another 10% on top. <laughs> and that's exactly. What, that's what and people do, write. It's not cathartic. Well, yeah. Exactly. The, the whole point of songwriting is that us blokes often don't talk to people about their problems so for me and I'm the same and I wish I wasn't but uh, that is just the reality for me so it's great for me and it's very cathartic being able to if I've got something that's really tearing me down or, or building me up or you know anything I can just I can turn inwards and just record it and while it's while it's being recorded and while it's being written it's for me it's for my process and it's to help me 
but as soon as it's released, um, it's not mine anymore. You know, it's, yeah. uh, it's for other people, and I, I, I'm, I'm certainly not going to go pop on and listen to it and relate to it in the way that I was when I was writing. Its job is done for me, mm. um, and from that point on, it's for everyone else. Yeah, which is a yeah, which that's, is that's the process. A very nice way of thinking about it. Hey, so where were you? Where do you come from originally, Willie? Uh, we're all Auckland boys. Okay. Uh, Josh uh, moved here when he was about nine or ten. He's a flying Scotsman, but uh, other than yeah. that, yeah, uh, we're all we're all Kiwi boys. Yeah, cool. And your surname, Ferrier, quite an unusual name, though. Yeah, I think it's derived from Ferrier, so somebody who uh, used to do horseshoes and things like that. Sure. Okay. Right. Yeah. Be- and I do love horses. I'm actually staring at one right now. Nice. <laughs> are, are you are you just pulled over just north of Cromwell somewhere? Where are we, Josh? Uh, we've just pulled out of Cromwell and had probably our third pie in a week from Sanger's Pies, which are, <laughs> we've been doing pie reviews up and down the country. And Sanger's Pies, if you haven't tried them no, in I Cromwell, haven't. they are absolutely out the gate. Okay. Well, insanely better than everything I've tried. I've lived here for so long and I haven't. So thank okay, you. Okay, well, you need to go to Chardonnay Street and try yourself a Sanger's Pie. Chardonnay Street, which is my favourite street. It's so good. It's so good. <laughs> yeah, well, we've got a, it's the last song on the album is Chardonnay. Um, so I thought that was a sign as well. Oh, it is totally a sign. I've got some mates who, who are very partial to, to drinking, and uh, I think their friends uh, always jokingly uh, refer to their street as Chardonnay Street because they're always sort of, you know, like um, <laughs> plastered on Chardonnay. But there is actually a Chardonnay Street. Uh, I forgot there was a real street. There is, there is. It's I'd be so lying cool. if I wasn't, temp- I wasn't tempted. 16-year-old me was tempted to jump up there and tear the side down. <laughs> um, just take it home. But um, I've, uh, yeah, oh, I've grown so up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, just don't. And st- I didn't have a tool. Don't steal the Cromwell fruit. That would be a mission, but that would be yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That would be a mission, but yeah. yeah, it would be wild. It would be wild if you could do that. <laughs> I've got one more quick. Have I got one more quick question? Probably. Oh no, maybe I've talked too long because I better let you get on. Um, so no gigs for a bit, but then the first one is twenty first of October. Yep, that's the one. We're yeah. off to just get home, reset, reach mm. out to batteries and, and work on a couple. We wrote a few songs in your wool shed the other night and then also back at the uh, place in Queenstown. So we've got a couple songs we want to... We've, we've, we can't help but get back into the songwriting side of things, uh, even just as, as a little bit of a brief intermission before we hit the rest of the tour. So... We're excited to get back and get into it. Oh, you, you're a fantastic uh, interview, Willie. I, I'm super impressed uh, with, uh, yeah, just your intelligence and uh, how well you string words together. And I cannot wait to hear the Woolshed song. So I'll make sure that Bayless, <laughs> that Bayless keeps me in the loop, right? So, um, and also... Uh, he uh, will. I'll hold him to that. Yeah, yeah. And when they come out, it will be terrific to play them, you know. So, um Honestly, yeah, good job. I mean, uh, although sometimes you wonder whether songs written at 3 a.m. are going to sound as good, you know, the next day. (laughs) (laughs) You'd be surprised. Some of our best work is uh, done uh, between the hours of 3 to 5, and sometimes, especially on the instrumentation side, sometimes it's hard to capture that lightning in a bottle again. Yeah. Um, That magic of sort of uh, the 4 a.m. vibe, sometimes uh, you just, you know, it's hard to reach that height again. Do you know, you're absolutely right because That's a bit um, of both. It, it is true. Like, I, I don't think any musicians uh, really come to life until sort of midnight and, you know, or one. Exactly. And then, but for you guys, uh, being in your... How, how old are you, Willie? Can I ask a personal question? What am I? I'm, I'm, I'm 29 now. 29, yeah, yeah. So enough experience on the clock to sort of know good and bad. But uh, but still young enough. <laughs> yeah. This is this is an older. This is a, this is a boomer talking. This is so bad. But what I'm saying is, it's a great age, 29, <laughs> isn't it? Because you've got some life experience behind you. Yeah, I've learned my limits, and I know now uh, it's a calculated risk when I when I breach them. I know when I'm crossing the line. Yeah. yeah, well, listen, have a... Doesn't mean I don't do it, but I just, at least I'm fully aware of it. Yeah, well, good on you. And uh, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure, and I, I was happy to post you guys. Next time, to just let me know that you're going to have a jam in the wool shed, and I'll, um, you know, I'll pull up a chair <laughs> yeah. and bring some Chardonnay. And, um, yeah, it was... You know, yeah. It was, it was, uh, we should definitely have let you know. It was, I think it was organised <laughs> mid pack down. We had about three places... And three different groups of people after the gig who were all kind of keen to go to one place. <laughs> yeah. And the band just decided, look, it's too hard to choose. We're just going to go somewhere where we can plug in our instruments and have a jam. So look. Sam Bayless kindly put his, his uh, hand up. put his hand up and we had a lovely evening. Oh, look, I'm glad you had a great time. And the boys, actually- I, don't think, I, think, I think we got home at about... 5.30, I don't think the boys, I think the, the boys had to go to their flight at 7.30am, so oh. I think they all had about 
maybe 15, 16 minutes of sleep, oh. all pumped out on the couch right before the taxi arrived. So it was <laughs> me and Joshua staying down to drive the van up, actually got a bit of uh, sweet redemption watching their faces as they had to get up and go to the airport at 7.30 after an all-night dinner. And you're like, oh, well. So, yeah, uh, that was their come up. And- good luck with that. There's nothing worse than flying when you feel so <laughs> lousy. It's horrible. But, yeah, at least it's short. <laughs> and oh, my this is our like, like um, yeah, I but, he, but, he, but he made it to a, he made it to a, a formal uh, what was it, it was a, a funeral I think up that day so he, he showed us his face after a glass of wine and he was back fighting fish. so <laughs> there's a bit of resilience in these in these 29 year olds still. Also, the, the lovely thing about you guys is, is your humour, you know. I mean, even your title, No Cigar, you know, it's kind of like, it is self-deprecating, but it's like, you it's know. self-deprecating. Yeah. yeah you're dead right. Yeah. But I, when, think that's, I think that's really... With, uh, to do with tall poppy syndrome, I think it's too easy for New Zealanders, and I'm the victim. Of, I'm a guilty, uh, uh, just as guilty of it sometimes without me realising. Uh, but it's just so inherent in our in our persona. It's we confuse it with humbleness, um, mm. Mm. and we're so eager to shoot down people who try to burn bright. So I think mm. the best thing you can do when people have tall poppy syndrome is be self-deprecating. If you mm. take the wind out of your sails, um, then no one else can. They can't take you down. You know. So I. They can't take you down if you already take yourself down. But I hate, <laughs> and then you can, I hate you know, that you about our country, though. It, it, I think it's our worst trait. I, I, I do. I, I, I detest it. I, I think do think it's our worst trait. It is. And, and, and we need to appreciate, but, you know, um, It people. is what it is. But, hey, you'll have the last laugh, so that's all good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hey, I've got <laughs> we'll pl- see, we'll see. I've got plaster lined up, Willie. Should we, should we take that and let you get back on the road? Absolutely. That's probably our favourite song to play live, Plaster. It really gets the... If, if, if there's anything going wrong during the set, by the time we put Plaster on, everyone just everyone's chakras are popping. <laughs> Love it. Hey, well, <laughs> safe travels, my man, and uh, you've been an, uh, the best guest. So um, thanks a million for your time, and we'll see you soon, eh? Awesome. Appreciate it. Willie Ferrier uh, from No Cigar, of course.